So I'm talking to J. Michael Aiken now. Uh, he's the script writer behind Dollar Down, which has won a stack of awards and has been nominated at numerous festivals, including the Nice International Filmmaker Festival, which is our festival. So congratulations, J. Michael. Really well done. And welcome to the Skype interview. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to, to talk with you and uh, looking forward to it. I'm really excited about this, uh, about the script, you know, and uh, I'm just amazed and noble that it's done so well. And, uh, and we're really looking forward to getting over to Nice as well. You know, there's a lot worse places to be. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I say that because we're lucky enough, I'm lucky enough to go over here to obviously London, in, in, in order, London, Nice, uh, Madrid. Um, Berlin and Milan and they're all amazing places obviously brilliant places but for me I mean I might have said this to you already is, Nice is my favourite there's nothing like that Mediterranean and just up the road from Cannes and just up the, up the road or a few miles away from Monaco in the other direction and it's it's heaven I mean I would <clears throat> I'd move there tomorrow if I could afford a, a place down there and of course for Brits it's 70 minutes on an aeroplane from Gatwick to Nice wow. yeah so we're really, well, really know, lucky, lucky. The, the odd thing, uh, Steve, about it is I've lived in South America, I've lived in Mexico, I've lived in the U.S., I've lived in China, but I have never even been to Europe because my what I do working in emerging markets uh, as a financial executive, mm. you know, it focuses on these emerging markets. So I have never even been to Europe. So I am really excited about getting over there. Oh my! Well, you've never been to you've never been to Europe at all. Can you believe it? No, never? I can't. No, because. <laughs> Because I mean, it's funny, I've got a whole, you know, actually, um, I've got a whole list of questions here, but the one that's um, really intriguing, well, they've all intrigued me, but the one that um, I looked at and I thought, I'm going to have to ask them first, which is, oh, you don't mind me asking you this first. Um, so I saw in 1980, I, so I did read that um, snippet you sent over to me. You won an excellism, ex, sorry, an excellence in journalism um, a few years ago, and yet you switched to become an accountant. I mean, tr- quite intrigued to find out why. You obviously got a gift for writing, and that's clear from your script. But there must have been a point where you thought, "Yeah, I really like that, but I'm going to be, I'm going to study accountancy." And then, of course, you flip back into the creative writing. So, how did that, how did that happen, and why did you take that path? Well, that's a that's a really good question, and um, and it's it. I did some um, some insightful reflection on that as you know as time went on. When I there was no about, doubt about it when I was a kid growing up that I wanted to be a writer. I loved writing. My mother was an English teacher. My grandmother was an English teacher, and it's just something that uh, was just ever present in our house. You know, a bunch of writers and um, people very devoted to literature, and so um, I started. You know, I got on the junior high school paper. I was editor of that. When mm. I was in high school, I started started writing for the city paper, the actual city paper, the Columbus Ledger Inquirer, and had a, a column called Teen Tempo. And every week I would write about things happening at Columbus High, which is a high school I was going to. Yeah. And just continue doing that. Also, I wrote for the, the high school paper and got up to where I was the editor there my senior year. I was just very involved in writing. But Steve, one of the the things, and I, I've got some. I got scholarships. I was fortunate enough to get scholarships. Um, Thomas Johnson Jr. of the LA Times gave me a scholarship, and I got one from the Columbus Press Club. So everyone was thinking I was going to go on and uh, be a journalist. And I love to write, Stephen, and, and I still do. But the thing is, I like writing from inspiration. And what I had been doing all these years was just writing routinely, and it had become mechanical and sort of the heart and soul of what. I love this inspirational writing just wasn't there. But at the same time, I really love business Mm. and uh, I've always been fascinated by business um, and I wanted to to share in that world as well. So I went to the University of Georgia my freshman year as a journalism major and then I changed because I just – you know, when you get away, you go to school, you you do that type of of, uh, introspective thinking and – so I studied uh, – I went from journalism to general business and ended up in accounting mm-hmm. and then um, later, later on went and got a master's of accountancy at the University of Georgia uh, and um, got my CPA. But when I was studying for my master's in accounting, I became in just – I was living at an international dorm at the University of Georgia and all around me were people from 
um, countries all over the world. It was amazing. And I'd never been, you know, I, I grew up, I was, I was born in Greenville, South Carolina, and I grew up in Georgia, and I never really traveled. I didn't even get on an airplane until I was 26 years old, and now I fly 100 times a year, you know, 100 <laughs> flights a year. So, I mean, really, it, it was just an amazing um, new world that I saw there. And so I said, you know, uh, I would really like to see what, if I could learn a foreign language. So I, I enrolled in this in Spanish there and didn't get any credit from my master's in accounting, but I picked it up. And within a week, I was actually speaking to some uh, of the fellows there from Colombia. Um, yeah, it was amazing. And so I found that I had this gift for languages. And so then I graduated and I went out and uh, started, I worked in public accounting and then got into manufacturing. Mm-hmm. Um and I, the first thing I did was I, I went abroad. I went to Mexico, and I was an auditor in Mexico for U.S. companies. And then I continued down that path, and, and every chance I got, I would go abroad. And then I went back um, and got a ma- an MBA in global management from a school called Thunderbird. I don't know if you ever heard about it, but it's uh, all it does is – MBAs in global management, and there I studied Chinese, uh, and along the way I picked up Portuguese, and so going through, uh, it was just basically the fact that I wanted to write from inspiration, Mm -hmm. not from this mechanical day-to-day, got to get it done, you know, sort of like what business administration is, and because I'd chosen this this path of international business that combined my love of languages and with this – how different it, it is outside the United States. And, and a lot of Americans, unless they live in, especially emerging markets like, uh, you know, Brazil, Mexico, Venezuela, China, they don't, it gives them a different perspective on life. Absolutely. Uh, if you learn that, Absolutely. Couldn't if, agree more. Couldn't agree more. Travel is so important. And, and in addition, Steve, if you learn the language, you even get to understand it to a, a greater, a, a more, uh, in-depth level of how that society and that culture thinks. So, you know, it was just, um, but but I never stopped loving to write. You know, I always wrote things, and even in my, my emails, you might even noted it, I just loved writing my emails. I'm just trying to do the best job I can, and um, so I've written technical articles and things over the years, but I always wanted to write screenplays. I love the movies. Uh, it just... I mean, I can sit back and on holidays and stuff, just kick back and watch movie after movie. So it just sort of after, you know, 37 years, it just sort of came full circle. And here I am writing this screenplay dollar down. But when you, I mean, you've, this is typical of why I love doing the interviews, which is I have these list of questions. And of course, you've already thrown me a couple of nuggets and I'm like, oh, that's great. I'm making a scribbling <laughs> on that here. But a couple of things just to pick up on there. Um, uh, I mean, I read this stat. I, I don't know if it's one of these, um, uh, you know, urban legends. I should really Google it, which is like something like seventy percent of Americans don't have passports. I don't know how true that is, but I suppose the question, my question to you is, from your experience of a U.S. citizen, would you say that there is a lot of U.S. citizens, people you know, that haven't travelled? Do you think that's complete bunkum? Well, I think that there are a lot. I don't know what the percentage is, but there are a lot of people in the U.S. that don't travel uh, outside the U.S. Um, and if they do, they might go to Cancun, Mexico, you know, just to go down to the beach or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, you know, people that live in the U.S. really enjoy it. I know when I was growing up, I was just um, – complacent. I was happy and just really saw no need to learn foreign language, to travel. Uh, again, like I told you, I, I deferred getting on a plane until I was 26. I just, it's, so I would say that uh, not, you know, there are a lot of Americans that do not travel very much. In fact, um, my, I have a brother and uh, he, he lives in Columbus, Georgia still. And he used to tell me, you know, when I'd I, when I was sent over, to, sent out uh, to Mexico, he says, "Look, he's a real country." I goes, "Look, if I want to go abroad, I go across the river to Phoenix City, Alabama." <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's his idea of going abroad. So, well, okay. you know, but uh, in general, I think that if more Americans would get out and travel, 
Uh, it's a wonderful experience, um, a great chance to, to grow as a person. And I think that um, it, it would just be better in general, just as we seek mutual understanding with, with other cultures and other worlds. Yeah. I just think it's a great idea. And to live abroad uh, is just an amazing experience. Oh, yeah. I, I, like I said a moment ago, <clears throat> I couldn't agree with you more. I think um, – I know we're going to get off peace to be here, and I go and I do this all the time, and I think it's, <laughs> yeah, it's the same in the UK. I mean, the whole Brexit thing, which has embarrassed me, but I, I voted to remain. And I, there's a block – there's a, there was blocks of people I know for a fact that don't travel, and I bet you – I bet my house that a lot of those people, a lot of them voted – to leave because <clears throat> they don't have a clue what it's like to meet other cultures or mix other, with mix other cultures, see things differently, you know, whether it's going to Spain or Italy or the US or Australia, whatever, or go somewhere and they don't really understand. And it's sad and it's really upsetting. And I just think, you know, if you could only see things differently and understand, I mean, look, I love going to France, I love going to Italy, Germany, Spain, all the others, amazing. Um, and I think people should do that more. And I know it can be expensive and I understand that. But in this day and age, especially in Europe, I'm only speaking from a, as a, from a British point of view, there is no excuse, especially with travel for Europe, because it's absolutely peanuts. You know, it really is cheap for us to travel. Right. But a lot of people still don't do it. They just can't be bothered or they're, I don't know, little Englanders or whatever reason. But, um, yeah, when that happened, it was deeply upsetting. I mean, I literally felt distraught when I woke up and saw that we'd vote to, to leave the EU. I mean, it was just... a. Th- um, as though lightning had struck me and a lot of my friends well I mean some people I know you know had their own look people can vote how they like but um, it, it was very very upsetting and I think if people travelled more I think that the result probably would have been different if I'm honest Right but it's interesting to note though Steve that you know the fact that you see these um, economic nationalist movements happening in the US uh, in Britain, um, perhaps in France, depending on the outcome mm. there, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, we need to understand it and we need to, you know, it, it's an important issue that, um, that people need to, to discuss and really understand, uh, because it's a reality mm. and it's something, it's something that is taking hold and, uh, it's quite an interesting phenomenon, but we, we really need to understand why. And, uh, in the end, we all live on the planet earth Absolutely. and we need to do the best we can to, to get along and, um, try to work together toward mutual prosperity and good health and good relations. Um, but that begins with understanding and thinking. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So when, <clears throat> just going back here, again, so I've got these questions, but as I said, you threw up a couple of interesting points. When you decided, although you had obviously this gift for um, writing, and, 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 and I now understand why you decided to do get into finance and accountancy, but when, when you decided to go down the road, um, did you was it was it a a, a a tough decision was it a very well sort of let me sorry I'm probably saying that badly but I guess what I'm getting at is you, you made that decision but was it kind of with a, a heavy heart or because I guess your first love was the writing side but or did that not really come into it? I, I'm trying to sort of understand how you felt when you decided right. that you were going to do this right it was not a hard decision Stephen I'll tell you why I always love business I mean I started a business when I was just a little kid. I would cut grass and, um, you know, clean gutters and do everything I could. I was a very entrepreneurial little fellow. <laughs> and uh, we've got a we've got a feedback here. Can you hear me well? Yeah, no, really well. It's really, really clear. Yeah. Got an echo sort of on my side. Uh, but anyway, so I love business, you know, ever since I was a young fellow. And um, I sort of felt, you know, if I go down this writing road, what about business? And as I continue to move forward in life and write more, I found that this mechanical nature of, you know, just getting the, the piece written, mm. um, just it was disheartening. And so at the point that I decided, you know, when I was my first year at, at University of Georgia uh, in journalism school, it was a very easy, easy decision. And I knew that I would someday come back to writing. Um, but the one thing about being a young fellow back then wanting to write and uh, where I am now in life is the last 25 or 30 years have my career international finance and business uh, has given me an amazing wealth of experiences 
from which I can draw uh, draw upon and, and write. And you know, I've seen things and I've, I've lived through. For example, Dollar Down talks about um, an attack on the U.S. dollar. And I've actually been in countries, Mexico in 94, Venezuela uh, 2006, 7, 8, and Brazil and other times. I've lived through what it's like to have your currency collapse. Mm. And I've seen the effect uh, I've done the actual accounting and I've walked out in the street and I've seen the actual effect on people's lives when the store of value, their their currency, uh, collapses. And so I said, you know, that's really interesting. Um, and as I travel and I'm, I'm in hotels a lot uh, and I, I'm on these planes and I, I just think uh, and I started putting together these ideas for, for actually doing a screenplay. But I didn't want it to be just about. A, a collapse of a currency, uh, but I did say, wouldn't it be interesting if they attack the U.S. dollar? Yeah. Why? Why? Because that's the global currency. I mean, commodities are traded in dollars, and uh, financial institutions worldwide use it. So, what would happen if that you know if that were to occur? And because a lot of people, and in my circles that I run with, a lot of them are worried about the. Uh, the fragility of the petrodollar system coming apart and, you know, the debt in the U.S. Obviously, there, there are other countries with a lot more debt. Uh, but the fact that the dollar is the global currency and the debt, the risk in the financial system, you know, we went through this horrible recession in 2008, 2009. And yet, from my perspective, Steve, there's, there's more risk now than there was back then because of the use of these risky financial instruments. And so I just, as I traveled, I just jotted down these ideas and I said, you know, it would be really interesting to put together something like that, but I need something more. And that something more was uh, another thing that I've seen over the last 30 years. Again, going back to my point that when I was real young, I just, I didn't have that wealth of experience to draw upon. And what I've seen in life is I've seen people do very well in life. uh, And then I've also seen successful people take a terrible fall, uh, become defeated because of tragedy in their life, whether it be uh, the loss of a loved one uh, or uh, something with their job or just a number of things. And just the idea of, of that, uh, that pain and sorrow and then the beauty of second chances in life and how a family, the, the um, unconditional love of a family – is so vital to helping that happen and that unconquerable element of support from the family. And so I wanted to, as the more I thought about it, traveling around, I said, wow, if I could combine these two elements into a story, I think I'd have something that audience would really join. So, you know, getting back to your, your question, these types of things, when I was a 18 year old kid, I, I just didn't have that kind of a, of an understanding of life. And so I always knew that as I went through life and learned more and became wiser, that I would have some great things I could write about, but it wouldn't be mechanical. It wouldn't be about getting the piece done so I can meet a deadline. It would be yeah. something inspirational yeah. that could change lives and cause people to think and, and entertain people. And so that's uh, that's what was the origin of Dollar Down. And <clears throat> I'm obviously I realise writing a script is a huge difference to writing a novel. I mean, it's massively different um, because obviously the process is different. But did you? Was it? I know you said you obviously had had in mind to write this as a script, but at any point did you think actually this will make a really good novel? Was it always going to be a script from from the the get go? I thought about that. I did on many hotel nights and plane trips. I thought, should I go novel or should I go script? But I love the movies, and I, I would say that it was my love of the movies that really propelled me to write a script. But the problem was I didn't know how to write a script. So mm. what I did, and this is an interesting thing, I went online and I some movies that I had, I actually had the DVDs, I got those scripts. And I would, as I would travel at night in the hotels, uh, and even when I'd be back here in Austin on the weekends, I would look at a scene, I would first read the script, uh, the screenplay for that scene, and then I would see how it was produced into film Uh, and so I learned the terms I learned by association of the actual film with the script and and I'm talking about about 20 of these um, some really good films I I learned how to write I said you know I can do this and you know I'm I'm not a a polished screenwriter I've been in Hollywood for 20 years but I understand the 
the structure of this. And I think, and because of, I love movies so much, I want this to be a movie. So that was what caused me to go with the script rather than the novel. And, and was, um, was the experience, because, sorry, is, I should have asked you <clears throat> earlier, J. Mark, was this, so this is your first attempt at an actual script. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Is, right, okay. Yes. That's and what was the process of putting it together? Um, well, two, two um, questions here, really. Was the process much more difficult than you thought or easier? And the second part of the question is, how many drafts did you get through till you got to this one? Right. The the process that I used was it was about what I expected it to be. Yeah. Um, no harder, uh, no easier. I knew it would be a challenge if I wanted to do it well. So I started with an outline, and I I started with um, thinking about characters. I, w- I wanted some very lively characters. And I wanted to have dialogue that embody the essence of those characters. For example, um, I have the, the Jenkins family, um, and Brad Jenkins is the main character, and he's the one that has this um, – he's a very successful workaholic financial executive. And uh, But then all of a sudden, his, uh, he has a tragic loss. His wife and small child die mm. tragically, and, and it's, it just causes him to – He's overcome, but and he blames himself. He he has this self-imposed prison of guilt because of something that happened, and he feels he feels the one responsible for it, and so it destroys him. He becomes a defeated man, uh, but at the same time, he still has his 89-year-old grandfather, Pops Pops Jenkins, and imagine if you will, and this is how I describe him in the script: Santa Claus dressed up as a cowboy. That's Pops. <laughs> he's a guy that he's an 89-year-old. Um, Texas rancher. He fought in World War II. He stormed the beaches of Normandy uh, June 6, 1944 in the script. Um, so he's faced evil uh, when he was just a teenager. Uh, and now he's 89 years old, but still very agile. Uh, and and he is a real force. And I wanted to develop characters like him. He's He's feisty. Um, he's a tough guy, but at the same time, he's, he loves his grandson, Brad, Brad very much and Liliana is great, uh, his great granddaughter. And so, um, I, the process was to develop these characters sort of independently dialogue. For example, I used a lot of Texas dialogue with pops when he says, uh, for example, he wants to be frank with Brad about his self-imposed guilt. He says, look, son, I'm going to shoot straight with you. You know, when he tells <laughs> Liliana to, to go to bed to say, Lily Dylan, go ahead and hit the hay. So, uh, you know, I weave that in there. And so I, I wrote uh, dialogue that that flowed from the outline because the first pro- process is obviously what's the outline. And it's an outline um, with two different worlds, the, the group of um, international bankers that set out to enrich themselves through a massive transfer of wealth by attacking the U.S. dollar and destroying it. Uh, and they set up this what they think is an uh, unfallible plan to, to enrich themselves. So I developed that world. And then I developed the Jenkins world, which Brad is in this search for redemption. He's, he's in this da- downward spiral, but he's got a just a sweet, vivacious, vivacious 10-year-old daughter and an 89-year-old grandfather. And, and they're there for him. And, and the strength of that love sustains him. And so I, I worked more on Brad's story first and the Jenkins family. And then I started working on, okay, I've got, a, I've got this um, background plot that's set against this story, this search for redemption by Brad Jenkins, in which this group, and they're a group of 12, and I call it hegemony, uh, which is sort of like a, you know, a, a dominant yeah. supranational force. And I said, um, you know, I started writing dialogue for these, and the head of hegemony is a, is a Brazilian billionaire called Alexander Santos. Uh, and he is – if you look at his dialogue, it is very rich and it's very eloquent, extremely eloquent, very formal, and he, he's so wealthy and so powerful that this entire process of um, attacking the dollar and, and trying to basically restructure world power through this massive wealth transfer is a game to him, and he approaches it by his dialogue and 
and the people uh, that surround him. Uh, you, you can just see that. So I, I invested a lot of time at flowing from, again, the, the outline of those two stories was this dialogue, very different, a very normal dialogue, um, the, the Texas dialogue for Pops and then uh, Brad Jenkins and, and his daughter, Norm Dialogue, and then this very eloquent dialogue to reflect the elitist nature of these international financiers. And then at some point in the script, these two worlds collide. And boy, does it get exciting. Uh, it's, it's an amazing experience when those two worlds, and Brad is down in Venezuela, he accidentally stumbles upon, uh, overhears this, this plan that nobody else knows about this, in an unbel- because these guys operate in the shadows. Mm. And, and I truly believe that in, in real life that there are these b- people that are very powerful that sort of are behind the scenes and calling the shots and uh, imposing their will in these supranational uh, uh, institutions. And so I, I worked on the dialogue of the two worlds flowing from the outline. And I also made sure as I was going through and writing these scenes – that I had this conflict that I referred to. And I said, you know, a good script has good conflict. The movies I've loved the most, there's some really good conflict. And in Dollar Down, the main conflict is basically good versus evil. It's Brad Jenkins, um, a guy in search of redemption, trying to trying to recover, find, find himself who bumps up against this greedy group of bankers out to enrich themselves. And um, so that uh, but that's also sort of a a conflict of um patriotic uh a patriotic person versus someone this group hegemony that doesn't even believe in um nationhood in fact alexander santos says that he says i don't believe in in the idea of nationhood i I owe no allegiance to any country he just cares about money um so so we had that conflict um we have conflict um within um, the group itself. And we also, I, I also get into um, what's happening at the White House. You know, when this happens, I take the uh, audience behind the scenes as to how uh, the White House and Fed would handle this. And I know enough about this to where I, and I did a lot of research on it. So it's a very realistic um, look at what would happen and how the uh, federal government in the U.S. Uh, try to address an attack on its currency and um, so there's conflict within there you've, you've got people within the White House that they don't get along and, and then I have uh, I wanted to put some humor in there so going back to Pop Jenkins the Brad's grandfather who looks like a Santa Claus dressed in a cowboy outfit <laughs> I've got this vision I, I've got this vision believe me and he and so um, part of the Jenkins household is a dog, Honor. And actually, I've got a dog called Honor, and uh, he's a black um, Czech Shepherd. We, we got him from the uh, Czech Republic. And uh, they, um, Honor and Pops, have this sort of playful conflict. Pops is the cook of the home because obviously Brad's wife is dead and, and uh, Brad's out all the time, and Pops is retired. So Pops says, Okay, I'll, I'll do the cooking. He's a great cook. So he cooks barbecue, good old Texas barbecue, and he cooks hamburgers. And but he's such a lively fellow, and he gets so engulfed in conversations and other things that he <laughs> he takes his eye off the ball. But Honor, the dog, is always fixated on Pops' sandwiches, and so he'll right when Pops is least expecting it, Honor, wham, he jumps on him and grabs a sandwich and takes off and. You know, so that sort of playful friction and, and conflict um, sort of permeates the script too. So, uh, you know, the going first of all, again, the process is first of all doing a flow of the outline, just a general outline, then working on really developing the characters the, um, and the uh, the dialogue to reflect the essence of those characters, and then um, making sure that there was conflict permeating through the script to keep it interesting and and also to, to make sure that people you know like pops and some of these others these smaller characters in the movie um, that weren't the main characters had a story of their own you can't do that with all the characters but it, you know i tried to pick a few and give more depth because i want the audience to care about what happens to these people so that was a process and then to your second question the, it was a very iterative process. After I got through with the creative aspect of, okay, I'm just going to write and I'm going to follow this outline and then I'll clean it up later. So once I got basically this body 
Um, I had about a hundred and I don't know, 180 pages. I said, no way I got to get this thing below 120. Yeah. And so I started with the iterations and Steve, I did 82 iterations <laughs> to where I finally got it to the final draft. 82. Oh my, do you know, I mean, the most I've heard of is like 20, so 82 is, I mean, what, what's, how long was the process from, because again, a lot of people won't realise this, I know a hell of a lot of research goes into writing scripts, but how long did it take from when you really started to, to think I'm going to, well, start working on this and from the very first day until the final version that you're pretty much happy with, the final version you're happy with, what, how long was that process? Once I had a rough draft, it was about a 12-week process, and um, I actually took time away from work, uh, and I finished it up over the Christmas holidays, and, and um, it was about 12 weeks, and I'm talking um, just all day, every day, seven days a week, just going over and over it, and then um, you know just pulling together and cleaning it up. But but behind that, you know, in my travels when I was going down to Latin America and traveling in the U.S. Every chance I had to do research or to, to focus on dialogue, I would I would do that. But the final, let's sit down and get it done. It was twelve weeks. Oh. <laughs> it's like I mean I know I know how tough this can be. So I honestly take my hat off to you. I've said this before to filmmakers and script writers. I just don't know how you've got the patience. To, I know actually, funny enough, because I know we talked about this on the um, I think on the phone that. Um, you, you're very much like me. You do a lot of work, I think, late late night or late evening, early morning, because I right. find that really creative and productive. And I think it's the same with you, isn't it? I believe that you often do that because you can get a lot more done then. That's right, because you've already done the work for the day. And, and a, a lot of times my uh, kids are in bed, my wife's in bed, and then I can just really have quality thought. And so that's where I make my most gains late at night. So I, I should really, um, I know you, you have sort of given us uh, some part of the outline, yeah, but can you, in a nutshell, just tell us what Dollar Down is? I know it's about an attack on the currency, but on the US dollar. But can you can you explain briefly what what the story is in a nutshell? Certainly, um, I alluded to the fact that you have. Brad Jenkins, uh, the once successful uh, workaholic financial executive, uh, devoted family man. Um, so it, he um, is he, he has this tragic loss and his world implodes. And he professionally and personally, um, he goes from being a vice president at a uh, finance at a, a sort of a CFO at a major multinational down to where he's just barely making ends meet at a community college teaching finance. Um, in Austin, Austin, Texas, and he's—you can see in the script that he's even struggling there. He just—he just cannot get past the pain, um, especially the fact that he blames himself for what happened. And it's—it's. It's and I've seen people like this. Steve. Yeah. It's not—you know—it's something very realistic that I've seen in others. And so, um, the—he—he he struggles with that. But then we see um, the love and the and the. Um, the support he has from his family. So there's a real tight-knit structure there. Um, at the same time, you've got this other world, the group of 12 called Hegemony. The movie opens in Rio de Janeiro uh, where they are, um, where, where Alexander Santos makes this um, really, I think, interesting um, speech about how they operate in the shadows and that now they're going to embark upon their greatest endeavor, and that is... And at the time, people don't understand what it is. He's just sort of introducing it to this group of 12 at one of their meetings at, at his huge um, villa in Rio. And so um, the script takes the audience through how um, Alexander Santos and his group, and you get to see there's a there's a Chinese executive, uh, Lu Zhong, there, who's his, sort of his right-hand man as, as well as – uh, Samaria Kanda, a uh, lady from um, New Delhi, who's a very successful banking executive. Those are the two top people for Alexandro, and then they have others. And, and you, I walk people through, and, that, and that's the interesting thing, Steve, about this. People will get insights into exactly if someone wanted to attack the U.S. currency, what where the weaknesses are. You know what what are the risks in the system right now? And if someone really wanted to do it, what would happen? Now, 
then I take them to the White House, and you have – there's this one guy there, one of the main characters, Treasury Secretary Richard Slaughter. And I specifically put Slaughter because right he is very wealthy, comes a very powerful family, um, and he's condescending. He's arrogant, and uh, you just love, love to hate him. You know, and he he makes this one statement in the in a White House meeting saying that debt doesn't matter. You know, the dollar is the global currency, and we can basically print what we want and force it on everybody because they have to use it. And so it's this greed and it's this arrogance, really, that that I think exists right now. I think we have these issues, and so um, I develop that plot. I I walk it down this course of how this would really unfold in real life. Um, and then I don't want to get too much into it because there's some plot twists mm -hmm. and uh, some other things, but it, it's really exciting. But the, the uh, there's a lot of action in there too, and this brings us into a point that you and I were trading emails on. Um, you know, w Brad just stumbles onto this. Brad Jenkins, the the guy in search for redemption, trying to find himself, he actually stumbles on to finding out about this through an incredible um, act of coincidence, and. Through a series of events, Santos, the Brazilian billionaire, billionaire finds out that Brad knows. And so, boom, they, they, they go after Brad to basically erase him and his family from, from the face of the planet. And that is when um, it's sort of like uh, if you imagine a doctor getting the – I think it's the EKG they put on the chest and boom, they just sort of jolt the patient back to life. Brad has to reach deep inside himself. For the sake of the, the, his family's life depends on it and and find that person that he used to be. And he has some hidden skills. And one of them I already told you about, the one yes. about, you know, his hop keto, his martial arts background. And he has some others, too. Um, so there's some there's some amazing action. I, I spent a tremendous amount of, of time and thought on a car chase scene. You, um, you kind of preempt me because I actually, they are, yeah, the key to, I have seen, sorry, Joe Michael, a couple of, or more than a couple, a few excerpts on youtube i took your advice there um and also i've made a note about the plymouth barracuda so because you you're uh, <clears throat> an exponent of this so perhaps you could explain um if you wouldn't mind um how you follow this and why you brought this into the script well i love action and when i go to see a movie i like to see good drama i like to see conflict, but I like action too, and, and some humor peppered throughout the script. So I said, you know, I love car chase scenes, and, and I love action. Um, and so I started studying these car chase scenes. I spent several weekends just looking at all the great ones, you know, in Bullet and yeah. Gone in 60 Seconds. And I mean, there's, there's uh, the YouTube has some really great ones. And so I, I saw them, and I said, you know, I understand how they did that. I want to do something different, so I'm going to start with a very different car. And I said, I'm going to pick something that Pops had, and so in the, in the script, Pops had bought this car in 1971. It's a 1971 Plymouth Hemi Barracuda. They call it the Hemi Cuda. You don't see that in movies. It, it's an amazing car. And I said, wouldn't it be great if Pops could have that sitting in the garage, and then when the, the bad guys come and try to take them out, um, if they can make it through that, they take off in that, that car, and we have a wonderful chase scene there. And um, I spent a lot of time going through an outline of what, what could happen. And it's a chase scene that goes through West Texas from Austin. They get out um, on I-10, which is just a flat straightaway. Um, and they're trying to get to El Paso. So I spent a lot of uh, time just working on that one chase scene. And I think that um, if this thing is made into a movie, which I certainly hope it is, it can be an amazing experience for audience to see um, that uh, because um, in this – in the script, we learned that when Brad was um, a teenager, he actually drove um, a few summers on the in these Texas um, races, you know, sort of an amateur racer. So he's a great driver. So he, you know, he has to draw upon these skills to help save his family. And I don't want to say any more because mm. then I, you know, I sort of give away uh, some of the really goodies there. But it's just, I'm just really excited about it. It's a movie, Steve, that I would want to see. That's why I wrote it. I said, this would be really entertaining. And, and and that's I shouldn't really have asked you about the upkeeper because it's obvious to me why you've included it because you know it so well and they say draw on life's experiences when you write so I can totally understand why you've decided to use it in the script because you know it and that's the thing that that you've and that's why you've embedded it into the script so um, 
you know, it makes perfect sense because why wouldn't you put something in there that you know about because you've got the experience about it? I mean, it's it sounds it's a bit of a silly question on my part, really, but it sounds it's fairly obvious, I guess. Right, but I think it's good because the the reason I think it's good, Steve, is because it gives credibility. Because when you go to see a movie, sometimes I've seen movies that said, you know, that really wasn't very realistic, but. I know how these things unfold. I've lived them. Mm. And, you know, it's never happened in America, in the United States, but um, could it? And see, that's one of the things that the audience is going to have to ask themselves when they walk out is, could this really happen in the U.S.? And so I think just from that, uh, from the dramatic element, it's very uh, thought-provoking. And um, I I think people are going to be talking about it for many months if they go to see it. And and just... Something that I picked up was quite intriguing. Um, you put in your emails, and again, we've we've mentioned. I've mentioned this to you in the email. This you've got a social campaign, social media campaign that I know your daughter's putting together for you. Um, but what's very interesting for me is um, a lot of. I mean, I speak to a lot of filmmakers, a lot of scriptwriters. Now they don't. It's hard to believe this, but this is true. They don't actually. Um, have they, they may use social media and Twitter and your Facebooks and so on and so forth. A lot of them do that, but they don't actually have a campaign built around the project they're working on, which I know sounds astonishing, but it's true. Um, and I, I applaud you for that because I think it's a really good thing to do, and it's it's a must do now. So, how did you how did that come about? I mean, was it always going to be the case, or did you talk to your daughter about this as you run the script? How did that all happen? Because I, I know I'm guessing what's happening happening. Unless you tell me uh, wrong, Jay Michael, is that You've structured this with your daughter to be launched at a specific time, um, which I guess is coming up very soon. But can you, yeah, can you just explain how you you went about doing that? And what what persuaded you to to put this campaign, this this future campaign together? Certainly, yeah, that's a great question too, because of the fact that uh, because of the nature of my work, Steve, um, I keep a very low profile. And if you look at my LinkedIn profile, for example, it's very generic. Uh, because where I go, I go like on the border in Mexico and down into Mexico and in, in Sao Paulo and, you know, all over in areas that are actually dangerous for Americans to be in. And uh, there's a kidnapping threat. Uh, yeah. You know, there's a lot there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of issues there, safety issues there. So um, just by virtue of the fact that I've wanted to keep a low profile, um, I don't have hardly any uh, presence on the Internet. And my sister um, who's just wonderfully talented, um, as well as my daughter, who's just um, amazing, um, began saying, hey, you know, <laughs> if you if you're really in it to win it, if you really want this thing to be made into a movie, you're going to have to um, really get a marketing campaign to, yeah. to do this. Yeah, and definitely. you have nothing. I mean, you're you're a low profile shadows kind of a guy. And you, so we agree that we would do it for the project itself. And so um, I'm just now getting underway with that. My sister Nancy is helping me with Instagram, and then I'm going to get my daughter to help me with either Twitter or Facebook, uh, but it's going to be about the project. Yeah. And, you know, as you as you alluded to earlier, I've been very fortunate that um, just right out of the bat, I wrote this thing in jan- January, and then in February I started entering it in film festivals, and it's already won five film festivals. Oh, no, it's incredible. And so, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, and, no, and, I, and the amount you've been nominated in and the wins is really off a scale. I mean, I, uh, as a, as a uh, I don't know, a, a finger in the air kind of thing, I would say script writers, if you win a couple, you're doing very well. So if you won five since, did you say January? February. 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 Christ, that is an astonishing achievement. So that should give you an indication of, you know, how good your script is. I mean, I don't know the first thing about these other festivals, but just the fact that you've won so many, been entered in so many, or been nominated in so many is a really salient and interesting thing to have, actually. Really, really well done. I appreciate it, and I'm really excited about it, and humble too, and I'm just I'm just thrilled about it. And so um, what, what we're going to do is we're going to link um, – you can link into these different film festivals so that people can see um, the wins. Um, and then we want to put some graphic content up and then put some teasers in there as well. Yeah. But the whole idea will be to um, sort of create the image of, of what the story is about. Uh, because, again, going back to why I'm doing this in the first place, Steve, this is a movie that I would want to see. And I believe there are a lot of people like me uh, that have these interests. And so um, we're going to get – 
uh, we're going to use social media. We're going to really ramp it up. Um, I just started doing this within the last couple of weeks uh, because I, I said, OK, I'm going to throw a few lines out there. I wrote this thing and I think it's good, but let's see what uh, what the public thinks. And so I sat back. I didn't say anything. Even a lot of people in my family didn't know about it. Uh, out, you know, my, my brothers and sisters and extended family. And then when it started um, getting these wins, I said, wow, you know, this is really going well. And so I got in touch with them and said, this is a this is a very worthwhile endeavor here. Let's, you know, could you get behind me and help me establish this social social media online presence um, for this project? Because I want to see it made into a movie. And truthfully, is this final script the final script, or do you see room for for adjustment? I ask that. It's a bit of a um, it's a bit of a um, a fun question on my part because whenever I speak to filmmakers, script writers. Most of them say, do you know what, I could just wish I could just have a bit more time to adjust this and the other, because I'm guessing you're thinking about this constantly. And do you think this is the final one, or can you see ways to change it? I think that um, I'm going to leave that up to the discretion of the producer and the director, if I'm fortunate enough to get it to that stage. So, yes, there's flexibility. Um, one of the things, Steve, when I was learning how to write a script and I was reading these screenplays and comparing the actual screenplays to the actual movies made, there, it was different. In fact, I used to, there was usually more verbiage, more dialogue, and more depth to the screenplay than you saw in the movie because of cost limitations. And as a business person, I understand that. So I know that um, what I have here is a story, and I've got some really good characters. And I know that um, when the project, the package is put together, they're going to be different um, personalities, mm. um, you know, the, the director, the producer, and they might want to modify things, uh, modify characters. And that's fine because in the end, what I want is the story, you know, and, and, it, and it can be modified. And um, but the essence, uh, the, the, the body of that story, I think, will be what what we see. Uh, but definitely, for example, um, if you think about. The, the martial arts scene, and we haven't talked about martial arts, but I, I have that in there. And, you know, yeah, as, yeah, as yeah, I've told you, I, yeah. um, I've never talked about this outside of my family or our dojo, the martial arts um, place where I study. Um, but I've been in the martial arts almost all my life. And right now I'm a fourth degree black belt in Hapkido. Yeah. Um, and so that's a very important part of this movie is that this is one of these hidden talents that – um, Brad has it, and the bad guys when they go after him, they think of he's just a nobody. They think they're just going to sweep him away, and no problem, they'll take care of it real quickly. What they don't know is that Brad is a fourth degree black belt, and he uses the martial arts to help him endure this pain, this self imposed prison of pain. Um, but he's still real sharp. And when you when you look at making the movie, um, when when the part of Brad is cast. Um, you know, in the script, I have them doing some some tough kicks, um, but mainly it's joint locks. Hot Keto is just an amazing martial art. It draws from Chinese chin na and Japanese aikijitsu, yeah. um, and it's complete martial art. But for it to be realistic, it had the it has to be adapted to the character, the main character, Brad Jenkins. So I know that when the uh, martial arts choreographers and the, the director get in. They might make some changes there, even in the fight scene, saying, well, this, you know, the actor we have cast for this um, is not able to do this, um, so we'll adapt that. But if you look at somebody like uh, Keno, Keno Reeves, mm. and when he did John, John Wick, yeah. he trained – I was looking at YouTube uh, on that when I uh, – so I love that movie, John Wick. He actually trained three or four months full-time um, to get learning uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and his – um, his instructor also knew uh, knew Hapkido, but he trained unbelievably. And so when you saw his character in that movie, John Wick, Wick it was very believable when he did oh, yeah. all this moves. And, of course, that was a lot more action than we have in Dollar Down. Yes. So yeah, yes. there, has, there has to be flexibility from the script to the finished product. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, that using um, John Wick as, as a great example, because it, the difference is it looks authentic. And I know, um, and it's what I said to you earlier, um, J. Mark, the, the, the thing is, I understand why you've put it in there, because you know it. That's the thing. You're drawing on life experience, and I know that that's why I use that martial art in there. And that makes, you know, perfect sense. It's a bit like me trying to 
try, trying to write about, I don't know, uh, karate, and but I don't actually have a clue. Why on earth would I put that in there? You know, so you're right to do that, and I think, you know, brilliant, brilliant um, way to to move the script along, and that's the uh, uh, an action part of the film. And as I also said, I I mean, I've actually got one of the tabs in the background here sitting on my computer. So I'm talking to you. I'm obviously not going to watch it at the moment. I did earlier, but I've watched some of these videos, and they are astounding to see. It's an amazing art, um, and Stephen, and and like I say, you got the scoop on this. I've never talked about this in any interview, and I've been interviewed in, in Spanish, you know, in Mexican TV, and um, just about business, never, you know, something like a script, but, and then, um, you know, and been in a lot of business circles, but I've never talked about it. Uh, I've always just kept it very personal, because it is, it's, it's just a part of who I am. Yeah. And, um, but it, it's a, it's a great art, and I'll tell you when I was working my sensei. Really, in, it's a Korean art. It should be subumnim, but we call my my subumnim sensei. His name is Armando Granados. Um, he's a he's a wonderful martial artist. I've been studying under him for 24, 24 years, twenty three years. Um, what we used to do when I lived in El Paso uh, back in the war, we had the Iraq War and some of those Gulf Wars. Um, Fort Bliss is in El Paso. And um, we had some guys that would train with us, and they would come in, um, and you know we would do the joint locks. And, and if you look at these videos yeah. on YouTube of hockey, you yeah. see these really cool joint locks that are. It's an amazingly effective art um, for hand-to-hand combat. And so we we found that uh, when they were doing their their basic training in Fort Bliss and, and having you know working with them before they were deployed to Iraq. These kids, you know, and I say kids, 18, 19, 20-year-old um, young adults, uh, men and women, they didn't have uh, an ability to, to fight. They didn't have that hand-to-hand combat that the people in our school did, had. So what we would do as a sort of a, a patriotic service is we would have them come in, um, usually on a set, Sunday, sometimes on a Saturday, and we would have about a two-hour class in which we would train them on um, knife disarms, um, joint locks, you know, we'd hit about three or four moves and do it over and over and over. Very effective things that they might find if they were walking around doing, um, you know, house to house recons, how they might, uh, what what they would use if they were to encounter someone who all of a sudden had a gun in their face. You know, we did a lot of gun disarms. Um, so, you know, that, I drew upon that experience as well in the fight scenes. That you'll actually see uh, there's a gun disarm that's very realistic there. Yeah, and as I said, it's it makes perfect sense because um, you know I've read before if you're going to write write about something you know about, draw on life experience, but it just seems sort of fairly obvious. So I totally understand why you put it in there. Well, J. Michael, that's that's kind of it. Would 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 you believe it's it's nearly an hour? And as I said, <laughs> I, you know, I did say to you, I said to you, you know what, it will fly by. Is there anything you'd like to add though? I mean, that, um, you'd like to say about the script? Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to touch upon? Well, I just um, it, it's really been a pleasure to write this. Uh, I'm just glad that I, I did it. You know, it's something a lot of people have these ideas, things they want to do, and they always say one day, you know, one day I'll do it. And I'm glad that one day came for me. And um, and I just I'm going to work very hard. Um, I'm going hopefully it will continue to do well in film festivals and and gain. Um, some credibility because you know each win is sort of a validation of the quality of the script and hopefully that Absolutely. will continue yeah. and I, I want to get it made in, into a movie because um, I've got Steve I've got 20 more ideas right now I could sit down and write a comedy I could sit down and write an action and I've got a number of ideas that I've just put out a few you know two or three synopses like a log line of, of things that I've seen again over this last 25 30 years and then all the experiences I've had both personally and professionally So uh, Dollar Down, hopefully, will be the first of many scripts to come. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Jake.